Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining me for another episode of Data Stories, where we explore the nexus between people and data. I'm your host, Behesha Humphrey, and I'm the CEO of the Data Science Alliance. Let's get started. So the DSA, we are a community of data experts and data lovers here in San Diego. And one thing we like to do is get together to share experiences. If you wanna keep, keep connected with us, um, you can follow us on one of several social media channels. Those are listed on your screen here. And um, let me tell you about what we plan to do today, which I'm really excited about. Today's data stories, we wanted to get a little bit real. We wanted to kind of take the time to talk about what could happen if you work as a data scientist um, for a company or an organization that may not be ready for you. Um, and the question is, what do you do? How do you ensure success when you aren't necessarily set up for it from the get-go? Maybe the organization isn't really sure what you do exactly as a data scientist or what you need to do your work and succeed, or maybe they're just not ready for your arrival. Today, we talked to three experts about their journey in data and their experience with this uh, reality check. We'll save 15 minutes for Q&A, so please feel free to submit your questions um, in the Q&A feature on Zoom. Okay, so joining me today for the conversation are Zyra Razu, Stuart Jones, and Greg Dixon. I'm going to take a couple minutes to tell you a little bit more about each of them. Zyra Razu is a data science program coordinator with the city of San Diego. Prior, prior to this role, she worked as a researcher and program manager in several universities and think tanks. As the director of research at UCSD's Center for US-Mexican Studies, Zyra collaborated with public and private sector partners using data to answer policy relevant questions. She has also designed and evaluated randomized control trials and conducted quantitative quantitative analysis on health, education, and job training programs with the goal of generating evidence-based recommendations for local and international policymakers. I've had the pleasure of working with Zyra and she's quite, quite impressive. Stuart Jones. Stuart Jones is CEO of Acorn Evaluation, an organization that works to help early childhood education programs use data for continuous quality improvement to increase the well being of children and families. Stewart has spent over 20 years working as a professional evaluator, primarily focusing on organizations that serve the early childhood community. In 2013, he formed Acorn Evaluation to further the goal of providing quality evaluation and consulting services to the ECE community. Greg Dixon is a partner and director of research and analytics for Acorn Evaluation. With over 20 years in higher education, Dr. Gregg brings his experience as an award-winning professor and applied social scientist to the ACORN team. Dr. Gregg served as an associate professor of political science at the University of West Georgia, associate director of analytics services at Murphy Center for Public Service, and a quantitative methods expert in the MPA and PhD programs at Walden University. Welcome to all of you. So I'm gonna start with um, just a kind of high level question get, so that we can all get to know you all a little bit more. Um, and I'll start with Zyra. Why don't you tell us a little bit more about your organization and your current role? Of course. Hi, and thank you for the introductions. 
Um, so as Vahija said, I work in the city of San Diego as a data scientist. Um, I work in the performance and analytics department, which is divided in, in three main areas, um, performance management, technology and innovation, and data and analytics. I currently work in the data and analytics team um, under the chief data officer of the city. And our main role is to partner with different departments to help them make um, a more efficient use of resources by making data informed um, decisions. So to, the, to this end, we look at their different databases. We work with them from the beginning to the end of the process to generate a business change or process change recommendation. Um, I, I have worked with different departments and before working here, I was working um, at UCSD, as Vahija said, and my background, which I think is similar to, to um, the other panelists, is on social science as well, but I specialized in data and data science as a result of my interest in impact evaluations. Great. Thank you. Um, we'll pass it over to Stuart. Same question. Tell us a little bit more about your role and your organization. Terrific. Thanks, Mahija, and welcome, everybody. I'm happy to be here. I'm a UCSD graduate from many years ago, along with Greg. Uh, we met in the dorms our freshman year. We were roommates of the very first class of Fifth College, which is now Eleanor Roosevelt College, both poli-sci professors. Um, I went on to not be a lawyer, and Greg went on to be a professor of political science. That was where I was headed. Uh, ended up being a um, professional evaluator, program evaluator. I have a, a graduate degree in human development psychology and started working with in the world of children and families. So um, I guess about 20 years ago, I started working with over 40 San Diego nonprofits. Right when a um, huge source of funding came online with the state, there's a tobacco tax in California called First Five. It was authored by Rob Reiner in 1998, and it dumps into San Diego County every year somewhere between 40 and 60 million dollars that gets distributed to about, I don't know, countless nonprofits breastfeeding education, smoking cessation, um, developmental screenings, just a huge investment in um, families living at the poverty level. And they all had a rider with all this funding to measure the impact and I became a measurer. And my evaluation background was creating evaluation plans, gathering data, crunching the numbers very academically and producing PowerPoints and binders that promptly went on shelves to die. And if you've been in that evaluation field, that's kind of how it goes. There's great fanfare and great investment in a big show, and then everybody forgets about it. So that's my experience, at least. Several years ago, um, along came data science, and I might have the timeline wrong for the hardcore data scientists, but from my vantage point, Tableau, Microsoft, Power BI, data science, live analytics, real-time decision-making, all has hit. And my thinking about seven years ago was let's marry that to this market of people who need it. So that's how we started. That's what ACORN is. We now work nationwide and almost primarily with the federally funded Head Start program, which is an $11 billion federal investment for children and families, zero to five, um, qualifying, living at poverty level all throughout the country. We started with a large San Diego nonprofit and very quickly our work to bring data science <laughs> to that sector has become massively popular and we are um, succeeding and getting our teeth kicked in simultaneously. So we're here today to share a little bit about that. Thank you. Greg, we'll pass it to you. So, so Stuart did a good job telling us about ACORN. Why don't you tell us a lot more about what you did for ACORN? Uh, I'm Director of Research and Analytics. So when we first started, I started doing data analysis and one of the biggest things was taking the world's messiest data sets that I had ever seen uh, and combining them together to try to make them make some semblance of sense and to make them usable. Uh, and my, my background is in quantitative social science analytics and uh, this was definitely an interesting project. And one of the things that we ran into is uh, it, my role as a university professor, high level researcher, my world was all about we're going to do the latest method in the most complicated way, and we're going to stand in front of a room full of people like us and present it, and we're going to really nerd out over exactly what statistical technique we used and was it R or Python or you know, all these kind of things. And then I stood in front of a room full of early childhood educators, people with ed Ds and very, very well-informed people, and I, Stuart would occasionally have to punch me in the arm because I would say something that was uh, completely 
outside of the room. <laughs> no one in the room, including Stuart, knew what I was talking about. And so my role became to help translate the sophisticated data science for that audience. And so I'm no longer doing a lot of the statistical analysis that I did in the beginning. Uh, I'm now doing a lot more, okay, what visualizations of the data, what parts of the data that's out there is usable, reflects the real world, and how do we communicate that most effectively? The other part we quickly realized is that there's a big interest, but not a lot of data capacity. So as a former college professor, uh, I was doing training programs for data capacity building. So my role is interesting twofold. There's the technical side of it, which is using the data, getting the data from all of our partners, learning the disparate data systems that are out there and how to make it all come together, and then building tools that are actually usable in the field. And then also using that experience to figure out what kind of training will land best and gives the most bang for the buck for the field out there in terms of building their data capacity and teaching them to use data more effectively in the actual space that they're in. That's, That's basically my job. Wow. I'm the yeah. wizard in the data cave, basically. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump back to Zyra just because I want to learn more about um, some of the projects that you maybe are working on right now or you've recently worked on that you'd like to share with, um, with us. Sure. Um, so as I was saying, um, part of our role is to help the city make a more efficient use of resources. So I think a good example of that is we partnered recently with the sustainability department. They are helping the fleet department to replace the, the city's vehicles with electric vehicles. However, the city has a lot of vehicles and you cannot replace all at once. And not all the vehicles are like the best candidates for replacement. So what we did to help them um, strategize this decision is we looked at um, transaction data for, from all of the city's fleet. And this is like millions of, of observations because a transaction is every time a vehicle overspeeds or every time a vehicle stops, starts, um, a bunch of observations. Wow. Uh, we were trying to define when a vehicle is parked um, based on the number of hours between the last time it stopped and the first time it started. And whenever a vehicle stopped for more than nine hours, that's defined as parked. So the reason we're doing this is because we're trying to identify where are the best places to put charging stations. Um, and those places are going to be the ones where most, the most number of vehicles park for nine hours or more. Um, so once we identify um, those areas where the, the most number of vehicles are parked, we can place the charging stations and then we can identify, well, which vehicles are more suitable for replacement right now to make like a phase decision um, and to, because you, you, you don't have like infinite resources, right? Um, so. I think one of the most interesting parts of this project is um, taking into account all of the operational uh, limitations and the operational um, restrictions that you have when working in a project like this, because it would be easier to say like, which are the cheapest vehicles to replace or which are the vehicles that we use the most? Well, that's not the right answer because if you don't have a charging station placed beforehand, you replace the vehicles and then there's nothing you can do. Um, so I think that's, that's a good example of making the best use of resources. And a project we're working on right now is in partnership with the fire department, which has always been a great partner. We have worked with them before in predictive analytics in terms of um, call volume and like total time on task responding to emergency calls. Uh, right now we're helping them plan for uh, COVID calls. And for that, um, what we're doing is they, we are analyzing um, not only trends in call volume, but different types of call. So what we were expecting when we were working with their data at first was, well, there's a pandemic right now, so pro probably the emergency services are gonna be overloaded with calls from people that think they are sick or they are actually sick, and maybe the services won't be, um, won't be able to deal with these this incoming calls. However, what we saw, interestingly enough, is there's been a decrease in the number, a very important decrease in the number of calls from March to July, when the, right about, uh, around where the stay home, stay home orders um, started. And that's like, if you think about it, it's because the less people are out and about, the less likely they are to get involved in risky behaviors. And also a lot of people are probably worried now of calling an ambulance and going to a hospital and then catching the virus there. But this, re this reduction in the, num the overall call volume 
that's something the fire department already knew because they work with this data every day and they like they are the ones responding to the calls so what we're, where we come in and try to provide some insight that adds value to, to their operations and help them plan is like we look at the types of calls so what we're seeing is that well, there's a decrease in the overall number of calls, there's an increase in the number of calls coming from COVID locations. So a COVID location is where someone in that location has already tested positive. Um, we're seeing an increase in, that, in the calls from that, those types of locations. And um, then what we see is like, well, what are the types of symptoms reported from calls in, this, in these areas? And the reason we're looking at that is to help the fire department plan ahead in terms of allocation of protective equipment for the paramedics, in terms of like in which hospitals we're gonna place these patients, and just like to have a better understanding in general of the types of symptoms that are likely to be tied to a COVID call, which is what the way we are categorizing calls coming from these areas. Um, so this is, this is just um, a couple of examples of using data to, to help improve or prevent um, uh, depletion of resources from the city. That's great. We're lucky to have you at the city. Um, I, I, I love that. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to pass it over to Stuart and I'm going to ask, um, I'm going to kind of jump into the, the sort of main topic of our conversation. Um, Stuart, why don't you tell us a little bit more about your journey as an expert um, and sort of what you experienced walking into a field that wasn't ready for the, the, the level of data that you were ready to deploy, what were the challenges, and more importantly, how did you overcome those challenges so that both you and the organization can succeed? Okay, thanks, Bahija. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of questions in there, so I think I'll do it with Zyra did and, and try to tell a story or two, and I, I do want to say to Zyra, I feel the same way that reaction, Bahija, I'm glad you're with this city. From a public policy perspective, as a citizen, as a taxpayer, as everything else, I think my expectation is there should be some smart management of things going on and take data and look at it and how can we do this more efficiently. So the two, two, two stories you're, you told go against, well, I always read the paper, which is waste and fraud and corruption. I'm like, okay, I guess government's horrible, but now it sounds like we're doing okay, at least if you're not just throwing your head against concrete all day long. We're, so, we're trying our best. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So I, I did want to say thank you, and I'm glad you're at the city, and it reminds me of, um, with the Obama administration, DJ Patil, you know, UCSD, data scientist in the United States, how can we do things more possible? Our entire business um, exists because of him and that in an indirect sense of that the challenge to the federal government was you're spending gajillions of dollars Let's do some data science and gather things and try to be more efficient, understand what there is. And that extremely applies to the Head Start community because since 1965, the federal government's dumped money into it. And when we arrived on the scene, they do, the only thing they do is turn in a census, which they call the PIR or Program Information Report. How many kids are we funded for? A thousand. How many kids received services? A thousand. How many kids got a hearing screening? A thousand. And, and this was literally, and, and I looked at it and some people put 996. I'm like, the answer is a thousand. But you know, that, that was the entire form. And that really is where they started. So when you say, what are the challenges we faced? Um, and I'm speaking very transparently and bluntly here for this small group of data scientists in the Data Science Alliance, but they kind of wanted it both ways. Bring us the sexy analytics that we can use right away, but make sure we don't look bad because they really wanted to protect their funding. And I'm sure I'd say with the fire department, everyone else is like, don't make us look like we waste money. Like we're not, we're helping you. So we really hit up against that in a huge way. The people who have hired us are the early adopters, the first ones to buy the VCR and buy the tech. They're like, we want those charts and we want that. There's 1700 Head Start grantees. The money goes straight from the federal government past states right into local agencies. 1,700 of them nationwide, about you know, 17 are the ones who are saying, come work with us. And then we come in the door and they say, we want to look really good compared to everybody else. And as an evaluator, I said, that would be a nice outcome. But really what we're going to do is try to break everything in here and show you all the pain points and help you understand and do these things efficiently. Like, we'll do it gently and carefully. So when we first came in, Greg and I built dashboards that were if there was a poster child for garbage in, garbage out, it's social science data because by the time it's compiled, you look and you go, this is all bad and we can't really do a lot with it. But we did do some salvaging. We did do some storytelling. So some of the lessons were this. Um, 
just as if I went into a room of any hundred people at random anywhere in the world and said, who likes math? There's going to be not that many people or who's good at art. People in the social service sector, not to generalize, but a lot of them have opted out of math and science years ago to be kids people. So one lesson was how do we make math cool and interesting and that statistics are there to help you and measure and inspire and, and make things efficient and learn. Um, so we did have to spend a lot of time and money and lessons in joining people where they were and providing them with engaging stories around that. Uh, the next is to really toe that line. How much can we make them look good and position them to receive money and be great while also getting them to improve? So the Edward Deming continuous quality improvement model is one that we're really into. Turn your data into pictures, decide what it shows you, not as final findings, but as explorative information. How can we build a plan to kind of learn more and also maybe tweak some things in a very small way? And then what does that teach us? And we just repeat the whole cycle. Instead of we've announced the findings or we've found the magic answer, we're doing these little CQI projects. And that involves connecting with a person with a relationship, building their fluency and literacy, joining them where they are and making the project nice and tight. So we have a project around child attendance and outcomes. Does a kid who comes more, you know, they get more dosage of the treatment, are they doing better? If a father is involved in a community where there's not a lot of fatherhood involvement, does that provide any kind of a boost? And how do we get more fathers involved? Can we use predictive analytics to tell early in the year, these risk factors we're measuring all kind of make the person a 90, like flag them as a red and say, we need to get involved with that family and make sure they have a bus and make sure they have nutrition, make sure they have the things they need so they don't drop from the program. So, you know, there's a lot going on. It's a roll up our sleeves and put people on our team into the trenches. It's a very individualized relationship-based building thing. And it's been far more difficult than we thought um, to, to do and, and challenging and interesting. And if I was a person with a ton of money, a Mark Zuckerberg, a Bill Gates, the idea here is you don't need to change much. You just need to build systems that invite people into data science, that educate them and give them little baby starting point projects. Just like in my world of ECE as a child development professional, that's how you scaffold learning. You start with beginner and then intermediate and advanced. And I think data science has come in with advanced. And we did that. Sexy tools and dashboards. And everyone's like, yay. And then they just stared at it. And we're like, it's actually really easy to use. The filters are over here and it does this. And they're like, nope. And we're like, nope. And we had to go right back to beginner land. So that's, ah, that's yeah. fascinating. I always, uh, I always say to um, my, my data scientist friends that um, you have to remember that a data scientist is two, those are two of the most scary words to yeah, not get together. <laughs> you have combined them into yeah. one, one phrase and you're not going to get a lot of like, oh, I know what yeah. you're talking about. Compliance <laughs> officer. You're like, no, I don't want to see that person. Yeah. Right. Two yeah. words together. <laughs> We've got a bit of a marketing problem. So, um, so I'm going to talk to, go back to Greg. Greg, um, you touched on sort of walking into the room and you were ready to go and you're, you've got this technical background and, and you, you just kind of, it went over people's heads. And um, I'd love to kind of dig into that a little and maybe if you can share sort of, okay, what did, what did that do? How, so how do you pivot from that and, and go from, I'm ready to, to start performing at this level and provide these types of insights to, oh, I don't even have clean data and maybe the data literacy isn't where it needs to be and how do I get that sort of raised up a little so we can meet in the middle? So maybe you can, can you talk us through that process? Yeah, I was, I was immensely helped by this in that I was a college professor and so every year I got a new batch of 18 year olds uh, and uh, in Georgia where I was teaching, everyone has to take American government and so everyone teaches American government regardless of your background. And so I was used to taking 18 year olds who in theory had just come out of a high school American government class, but that was almost always taught by the football coach in Georgia. So it wasn't always the most rigorous. And so coming in and saying in my first year teaching American government, I was super excited. I'm going to teach civic engagement. I'm going to bring everybody in. And it lands like a straight lead balloon to 18 year olds who don't care. And we also had a huge problem in that it's a bloodbath freshman year in a lot of state universities. And so there's a lot of pressure to come in and say, okay, 
we're gonna, we've got to lower the rates of D's, F's, and withdrawals in freshman classes. And so what got me my teaching awards was switching from a lot of in-person stuff to bringing in digital platforms and being able to track engagement data and designing the course in such a way that I could find the high-risk students in the first week to 10 days, intervene with them, and reduce the DFW rate. And so I had had this experience in what was originally my chosen profession of, wow, I'm landing like a lead balloon. I've got to adjust what I'm doing. When I came in to work with ACORN, it was a very similar experience, except that these aren't 18 year olds with no experience. These are people with 30 year careers, doctorates, who have made their careers in a world in which there's a set of rules. And the rules do not include data science. In fact, the experience in early childhood education, they all look at K-12, where data has traditionally been used as a giant anvil to drop on people's heads. It's the justification for firing your principal, bringing in salary cuts for everybody. There's a, a cutthroat competition that's there. And so I had to recognize the world that I was in. And uh, after a couple of not so uh, edifying <laughs> initial forays of trying to explain these things, uh, it's, it's that moment where you realize you're in a room and the people on that other end, they really do genuinely need to use data. And you, there's enormous benefits to be had, truly enormous benefits. But you have to meet them where they are or there's just nothing there. They're just going to not listen to you. They're going to tune you out. And when you're in a world in which data has been weaponized against people that they know, their friends who went on to K-12 tell horror stories, you have to be able to make data friendly. So data transparency is one of the biggest things. Why am I collecting the data? What is my project for? How am I going to use it? Bringing in people on the line who have been collecting data that went off into a black hole someplace and was never seen again and showing them. I'm going to take your data and we're going to make it meaningful. And the easiest story is one of the first projects we did in Head Start is a family screening. The data originally came in and it was going to be part of this neat machine learning project to build a risk index. And the problem is when I first looked at the data on families, this is San Diego. You've got to be at or below the poverty line to qualify for the program. And yet the percentage of families who were struggling financially was low single digits. There's no way that that's true. Domestic violence, low single digits. No way that that's true. We know from other aspects of the, the information we can get from elsewhere that there's no way that that's true. Category after category after category, it wasn't recording reality. So any risk index we built was going to be garbage because it's garbage in, garbage out. But they really wanted to do this well. And so we helped them to build a better data collection tool that gave better data, which then allows you to act. And it took two years, and it took a lot of nuts and bolts in getting our hands dirty. But when the data came out of that, we were able to communicate it in a simple thing. Family's doing great, green. Family's about average, gray. Family's in trouble, red. And it was very easy for the field to use. We brought field people in, and we were able to translate the data through data transparency and building data literacy kind of through a side door by showing them how the data could be used and how the data could be effective. And then that one project feeds the next project and the next project. So the biggest thing that I would say is you have to go in with an open mind and you have to go in with the recognition that no matter how high your skill level is as a data scientist, if they're not going to use the results of your work for whatever reason, whether it's a lack of will or a lack of training, uh, doesn't matter, if they're not gonna use it, then you're just spinning your wheels. You can have the greatest, most complicated, wonderful project, but if it doesn't lead to anything impactful, it's not as useful. So that translation, meeting people where they are, and as a person in a private business, uh, what does this mean for what I'm going to do? And honestly, part of what made things work for us is this, this idea of, okay, it's not a problem that they have all these things. This is just the state of the world. And what then do we need to do to address it? And that's where the training work that we did came from. Data capacity is low. Data literacy is low. Okay, well, that's a fixable thing. And they want to fix it. And they just got to figure out how. And so then the next two years is figuring out how to do two things up. It's not an easy process, but it has to start with an open mind and the willingness to step in and adjust what you're doing. That's great. I, um... hey, Jeff, you don't mind. I just want to pick sure. back super briefly on the end of grade yeah. because um, – what he's talking about, there were two other things we discovered with that family strengths project, and they were hard for us to navigate. The first was a process thing. So there, this particular agency had about 300 staff out in the field with 8,000 families gathering this information. 
data scientists, when we visualize it, data scientists are always like, there's 28 and 106, and it's very, very um, uh, apolitical, like the stats of the stats and the numbers of the numbers. But when we visualized all this data, it was very clear that, that a big portion of their workers weren't working. They just were not doing the tool to fidelity. They, they've never had any accountability. So data science brings transparency and instant accountability. I'm sure Zyrus had this with like, here's all the firefighter numbers. And they're like, me, because when you see it for the first time, now you're ruffling some feathers. So I know from my data science colleagues in the corporate world, they have the same concerns. If I show sales figures for the first time in beautiful things, it's going to separate between high performers and low performers in new ways. So we visualize the data and all of a sudden it wasn't about how are the families doing this. Our workforce is a, is a mess. And then the boss was like, I'm the one who's accountable for holding all these people accountable. And this makes me look bad. So when we came in with kind of, here's how everybody's doing and here's what the numbers tell you, there were really two parts of the story. This whole system is really bad and someone was responsible for it. So now when I'm working with the different places and they're setting Greg up to do projects, I am in a political situation. It's like, we're about to bring tons of transparency and with it accountability through the visualization and the storytelling around your data. And some people are like, you go away now. <laughs> I liked it better before. And that's a barrier that I think any data scientist who comes in with a great ethical um, welcome arm saying, hey, I'm going to show you exactly what's going on. To be aware of exactly what's going on might be a little dicey, especially in antiquated bureaucratical kind of places, it needs to be brought in. And that's where I've, I've done most of my professional learning is how do I set that up for success? How do I preview and describe that? How do I give examples and make sure that to the yep. extent possible, it's emotionally and, and culturally within the agency safe to do that. And that involves my main job now is to connect with the CEO or the main stakeholder and say, this is what's coming to you. Massive amounts of transparency. And if you weaponize this, <laughs> I lose, you lose, you're going to lose your team. There's a way to set this up for success. And if, if anybody on here wants to connect to me about that offline, boy, there's been some lessons learned in that in terms <laughs> of making sure you're going to hire us and bring us in. You have a responsibility for the narrative and what you're going to do with this information besides go fired, fired, hired, hired. I mean, and some people want to do that. They, they want ruthless efficiency. So, and, and that might be your the job. Short, yeah. I think it's the shorthand. Go ahead. I was going to say the shorthand of, of any starting project now is if we do this, it's going to show everything as it is, not as you wish it to be. Yeah, and that's the opening yeah. part for everything. And we yeah. make sure that they understand at the beginning. And if they're not interested, then they usually tell us to stop at that point. But a lot of places are interested in improving, and it definitely does help uh, yeah. when they get to that point. And I think that's, that's one of the main challenges I, I faced as well. It's like an eternal fight against anecdotal evidence. It's like, well, I already think it's this way because I've ex I've, I'm an experienced person in this field for 10 years. You're new. What do you know? And it's like, well... You might be right, but let, let's test it. I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm saying like we can test whether. So I, I clearly, clearly remember a meeting I had, not naming any, any names, but we were evaluating a, a program. And after we presented our data collection and data analysis strategy, this person made sure everyone was listening. And he just said, data is garbage. And to be clear, I don't, <laughs> I don't think this this person was trying to be rude. I think he was reflecting what a lot of people think, which is like, you can torture data. Well, a lot of people think you can torture data to make it say what you want to say and hide what you want to hide. But that, that is only true when you, when your methods and the, and your, and your, the process you follow to arrive to a result is not transparent. But if you're documenting the process from beginning to end and everyone can go in and check every step of the process and replicate it, then that's not true. You might be making a mistake and people can correct you. And that's like, that's the whole point of the scientific, scientific method. But um, I think that this idea that data is garbage and that you can just like generate any result you want is because a lot of people are used to relying on ad hoc reports that are very obscure, that no one can replicate and if they just like show a very nice visual, but if you try to like question like how did you arrive to that very beautiful interactive graph, like no one knows. It's just like, and they, they just go on, on and on repeating a story that that's very hard to replicate and it's not documented anywhere. 
But I think that as long as you're transparent and you, you are very clear on what, which method you're following, what are your data sources, what are your assumptions, and you're very clear about your assumptions, um, it's very easy to, to convince people that data is a tool they can use in their advantage and not something they need to be afraid of. That's great. I, um, I've also have had experience with this as well. I think for, for me, what it came down to, the core of it was trust. Um, there was a sort of trust broken at some point with, with these people, these employees, and, and data and, and numbers and, and being held accountable and them feeling unfair. And so I think to, to, your, to all of your points, the, the key is building trust and, and, and part of that is transparency and understanding and making sure the subject matter expert is involved. Um, and these are all important. My concern and something we've talked about as an organization, because um, it, as this field becomes more and more popular, we get more and more young, um, new data scientists. My concern is they're not ready for that. And um, what I'd like to, as a last question before we get to the q and A, is um, I've learned the importance of the sort of not the, the soft skills needed to succeed in data. And that that's the, the, the trust building, the explaining what your role is and the what you can do versus what you can't do. And um, I know UCSD is doing a great job with teaching some of these soft skills and embedding it into their program. I don't know if every university is, and I also don't know if the students value it as much as they should be. And it's sort of a rude awakening because they feel like they walk in and they're, they're not prepared. And so I, I'd love to pass it over to you to talk about some of those soft skills you've had to use, whether you, you were ready to or not, um, to, to, to kind of smooth things over and, and succeed um, so that we can start to have these kinds of tough conversations so that uh, the next generation of data scientists is ready with, with that, um, with that skill set. Uh, I'll pass it to you, Zyra. Well, I think it's key to find like a, an ally and a, someone that partners with you from the beginning of the, of the project that you're working on. Because as I said, um, it's very important to make your assumptions transparent, but you need to have your audience engaged and to agree with those assumptions from the beginning. So that when you present your results, they're not like, oh, no, no, this is, you're getting these results because you, you are getting my data wrong or you're using the wrong fields. It's like you need to have them involved from the beginning. And, and it helps you too because it helps you understand what, is, what, is, what are the actual processes that you can affect with your analysis and what are the things that you should just like not even try because they're, they're ingrained in the way that the, the, that the organization works. Um, so I think it's like one of my main learnings in this in this job and past jobs it's just like find someone to partner with you on the project from the very beginning that can provide um, subject matter expertise and that can also validate your findings when you are once you arrive at them because they have validated your assumptions from the very beginning great so greg what about you actually that is pretty much exactly what Zara just said it's exactly one of the biggest things that we found when we were Nerds on the outside going through and crafting dashboards. The first response everybody says, oh, you got that wrong. <laughs> and our response, no, actually, this is what your data said. Uh, we have a field team that now goes out for quality improvement projects. It is embedded. They're all Head Start professionals. They've got experience. They go and they actually talk to people. And they walk through the whole workflow of where the data comes from, how it's collected. And there's now a kind of like you have to qualify for getting some of these tools because we need to go out and actually see how you're collecting it. If you are collecting the data and it's just most important things, check in the box, and it doesn't matter what's in the form, then the data is not going to come out well. And then the quality improvement project starts with, let's improve the data collection. And then we use the data to support that. So there's nothing big and fancy. These are pivot tables and pivot charts in Excel. But this is what your data collection said. 100% of our families are doing great financially under the poverty level in San Diego. We've improved data collection. Do you have to train people? Do you have to train the supervisors to go back and actually hold their people accountable in a safe, emotionally open environment where people can essentially say, I'm a little confused by this. What am I supposed to do? And not have that used against them. So there's a whole series of these things that are out there. But getting a team 
on board that includes non-data scientists so that you have a sense of how is the data going to be used? How is it actually collected? And we learn so much from the people on the ground, from the teachers who say, yeah, we're supposed to do it that way, but nobody does because you can't in a real world classroom do it that way. And these are the things that we find out all the time. And then it's like, okay, well, tell me how you're really doing it. I promise not to tell your boss. And then they tell us and we honor that confidentiality so that we can know that the data is going to tell certain stories. And then we can say, well, how do we alter this data collection so that it's real and valid and it does the things we want it to do. And that multi-layered bit is really what's made us successful where we've been successful. And the best part about this is you're building a team of people, not just on that project, but for future projects who have experience with non-weaponized data, who have experience with data that actually did help them do their jobs. We changed this thing and oh my God, the guy with the PhD listened to me with my associate's degree and my 10 years of experience about what it's like to teach in a classroom in early childhood. And this guy's got a PhD and he took notes at what I was saying and he came back a month later and had stuff that I had talked about in his data storytelling. These are the kind of things that are enormously important. And those are soft skills, learning to listen to people, learning to take what they have to say, ask follow-up questions that respect where they are and that meet them in their real world and honor their lived experiences while still being able to do the quality data work. And honestly, data transparency, the, the academic training that I had, you go off into a room and you program everything in R and you put it all out there in the world and you have a table that summarizes it all in some visualizations and a bunch of other nerds are gonna look at it, that's it. But what, is, what does this mean for anybody and how do you explain it to real people? Nobody cared. <laughs> you never got published explaining it in plain language. You got, you got published because you have some really cool R code <laughs> that's in the, the appendix. And so the biggest thing that I would tell anybody who's looking at these kind of situations is be as transparent as possible, build a team of people that are not data scientists, the biggest thing that I would tell anybody who's a student is talk to your friends that aren't in the data science program about what they're doing in social science, wherever they are, it doesn't really matter. Find an artist or two who's in there too, because you'll be surprised at how data visualization can be supported by the things that artists learn. And just have a group of people that sit there and talk about things and find stuff in the newspaper or in things like that that are out there and talk about how the data supports things or doesn't. Get a sense of what people feel. It's a good practice, A, just to be, social and B to get a feel for what it's like from other areas. But you, if you don't build a team that includes non-data scientists, you're going to miss 99% of the time. It's great. And then Stuart, um, we have a couple more minutes and then we do have a, a few questions. So Stuart, what about, what about from your experience? Well, I'm a father of five kids. Um, <laughs> I've got a college student at Cal Poly. And I've got uh, a whole bunch of other kids all the way down to a five-year-old. And I'm a child development guy and I run a summer camp. So I employ 118 to 22 year olds. So I'm in the position of giving a lot of life advice, whether it's good or not, or whether I'm anything close to an expert is something else. But there are some things I feel pretty strongly about. And one is telling college students, get out of your bubble because college is a bubble. And boy, is that true in data science. We've been over to the university a bunch of times and it is a very tight community of nerds and they all like doing nerd things together, just like all the athletes like doing athlete things together and all these kids like doing things together. That's never really changed. And I would say that people in the data science community are super excited about being really good at data science and graduating and getting a job doing data science. And I would tell them, you gotta figure out a whole different way to be because if you think you're going to get paid to live in a cave and do math, um, you're going to be um, replaced by computers in the next bunch of years. And so being able to communicate and talk and work with people is seek out internships and jobs in which you're bad at it, in which you fail um, over and over. So go be a camp counselor, you know, go try teaching, go do something totally differently than what you're doing because you're going to get immense payoffs relative to your skill set and be able to go work for Zyra and she goes, I need you to go to the fire department. You're like, no, no, I do numbers. And she goes, you're going down to fire station X and talking to Chief Johnson and telling him what's going on. They're like, that, I make dashboards. And I think that's where my real question is, why are you even doing data science in the first place? Now, what's, the, what's the point? And the point is to go out into the real world and influence it. So if you can't go out in the real world and influence it, 
I'm not sure that you're going to succeed. I had the ability or the opportunity to go to China last year for three weeks, travel, speak, and train at a whole bunch of different um, programs. So I'm talking mostly to parents who are between, I'd say, 30 and 50 years old. And this generation of Chinese parents were highly educated to be exceptionally skilled in math and science. But that meant going to school from 6 a.m. to midnight every day their whole lives and not doing anything else. So they all now have um, children and they're doing the same thing. But deep down in their hearts, they know, I don't know if this is the best method. And I went over as American child development summer camp evaluator guy. And I said, the whole child education is critically important. Getting them out to actually resolve conflicts and argue with each other and design things and work as teams is what the next century needs because all your kids, what they're doing is doing what you're doing. And you already know you're going to be replaced by AI very soon. And they're like, and I'm like, I'm just telling you the truth. So if you really want to do good parenting, you have to well round them across the board and not triple down on science and math. So imagine I'm speaking to like two, three, 400 people. And there's a line of people who are like, I want to ask you more questions. The other ones are walking out the door being like, la, 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 la. I don't want to hear that. But that's what I would tell anybody anywhere is well round yourself when you yeah. can. And, you know, I already know you can program. Can you it's go? It's that whole idea of range, right? Yeah, big it's a range. Great yeah. book. Yeah, if you haven't read it, just it, yep. you know, get, yeah, get go, go out and make some messy mistakes. Go out yeah. and be bad at something. If, if, I, if I'm interning, I, I wish I was 22 and I could follow up with Zyra after this and be like, hire me, do something, give me a job and data so I can go experience the mess of trying to work with city bureaucracies to even get them to consider moving the needle. That would have been great for me as a 22 year old. I would have signed up that in 10 seconds. Now I'm creating a program for you, Zara, on the fly. <laughs> you could send all the people to you and like go eat it. Got yeah, a bunch of recruits for you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, that's, I'm listening to what she's doing and going, you should just get an army of failure yep. people ready to go out and hit their heads against the wall and pick the best from them and hire them. And that's, that's yeah. what I do, public policy wise. Yeah. Okay, so um, this is in such an insightful conversation. Um, I could talk to you guys for, for hours, um, but I do want to respect, there's been a couple questions submitted. I'm going to just read them, and then whoever wants to answer, jump in. Um, so the first one is from Aman. I hope I said that right. I think I did. Aman. Good afternoon to all panelists. My name is Aman. I'm a student of computer science from India. Wow, thanks for joining us. My question is, according to your experience in the coming years, what is what the industry would need more, developers or data scientists? Buzzer, does anyone? Uh, <laughs> Gregory? I wouldn't, I wouldn't, yeah, I, what I would say is that that's the kind of question that uh, basically none of us are going to be able to answer because what's going to happen is AI is going to replace a lot of the line work that people are doing now as developers. There's a whole world of development that's going to basically go away from human beings. But at the same time, new avenues of development are going to open up. Um, the biggest thing for me is when I see people who are in this, there's this, there is this sense of, I just want to be a coder. I want to go do these things. I want to do development. I don't want to take that next step. And my advice is always, that's fine, but you're also putting a ceiling on your career because developers will get to a point and that's it. If you can't talk to other people, if you can't do other things, you hit that ceiling and you're going to hit it at about 30. And when you move out of that tier of developers, you're going to need some of these other skills that come from data scientists, but also some of the soft skills that we've been talking about. So I would encourage people to say, where do you fit better? Because there's going to be jobs in both of those. And if you just want to sit in a room and be the best coder in the world, then you're going to be a developer. But if you want to actually work with people to turn data into better outcomes in the world, you're going to be a data scientist. Also, if you want to just figure out how to target ads and make money, also a data scientist. But uh, there's, there's different pieces that are in there. Um, the, you, you are under threat from AI in either direction, but you can also protect yourself as long as you just don't ever get too comfortable where you are. Anyone have anything to add? Okay, so the next question is from Rakesh. What are some of the pros and cons of being in data science or analytics? Oh, it looks like this is for Zyra. For the city of San Diego in relation to working in the private sector. Okay, um, not the salary. The salary is not a pro. <laughs> but um, it, I think it depends on what's, 
what drives you and why why are you interested in data science to begin with as, as i said when when we were doing the introductions i ended up in the data science field because i i started in political science and i i started specializing in in program evaluation and one thing i've always cared about is making an impact whatever it is in in like the public good um so that's something i care about so that's i I like data science, but I like data science as a tool to do something else, to, to affect change. Um, so one of the pros of working in the city of San Diego versus the private sector is I think you have the opportunity to, to, uh, to affect, affect change in the lives of the residents in a very small way, maybe if you're only one person, but if you belong to an amazing team, as I'm lucky to do, uh, I, I think it, it's, very, it's a very meaningful job. So that's one pro. Another pro is that I'm, it's a very intellectually challenging because of the reasons that, that we've been discussing. It's not just like writing code, which is something I love doing, and that's why I think I got the job, but it's also, I, I love learning about the types of um, operations and processes that, that the city is working on to provide services to the, to the residents. So, and that's something I wouldn't be learning from like any other way. I have to work here to understand these operations in and out. Um, and I think, one of the cons I see of working in the city, it's that things move very slow uh, with, with bureaucracy and, and you have to be patient and you have to really care about the end goal to, to be able to deal with, with the pace of, at which some of the things move. Um, but I'm fine with it so far and I'm, I'm, I'm really loving it. I think that you can also work in the private sector and have a meaningful job. Um, it's just, it just depends on, on your interests and the, and the way you're trying to like leave a footprint in the world, I would say. That's great. Thank you, Zyra. Well, uh, one last question, and we'll, we'll I'll, I ask this of all three of you as sort of the final question um, before we start to close up shop. Um, what is the one thing you want people who are not data scientists to know about your job? Greg, you go for it. Go for it. Uh, I want them to understand that I am not actually a wizard in a cave conjuring good stories about their programs uh, from their data. And uh, that data is not actually something that can tell any story you want it to. Uh, I think that that's one of the biggest misconceptions. There's two big misconceptions. One is that I'm literally a, a wizard who has a, I, I should have a staff in the background or something when I'm doing this. And I just wave my hands and things appear. Um, one of the biggest things about data science is we're not wizards. We are dealing with things that ultimately are grounded in the real world, even if sometimes it seems pretty esoteric, and that we can't, that ultimately if we're being responsible in our jobs, uh, we are always grounded in what's going on in the real world. So that's one of the, the biggest things is that we're not magicians. The other piece of it is that we're also not the enemy. Uh, the idea is there's two versions of data science. There's the my employer is using data science to drop an anvil on my head because they want me to work harder for less money, or there's somebody out there who's using data science for evil purposes to target ads about me and track and predict everything about my life in ways that I don't like. Those are the things that people think about. Uh, and most of what data science does has nothing to do with either of those. There's enormous potential for good coming from data scientists. And we can, if we connect with people and we are transparent about what we do, do an enormous amount of good. I mean, just the, the amount of good that has been done in the small number of programs that have been with us for four and five years of improving services to kids, uh, it's truly spectacular. Head Start serves a million kids a year and we're just getting to the early adopters right now out of 1700 programs. If 10 years from now, we have transformed data literacy, data capacity, and made just made programs adopt continuous quality improvement the way the private sector has to improve private service delivery in terms of how they get kids out of poverty in an anti-poverty program, then I will be able to look back and say that I have literally made the lives of millions of people better. And you're just not going to be able to say that in a lot of positions. And I think that there's a genuine chance that I can say that, not as hyperbole, but as a legitimate claim that I will, by the time I retire, have made the lives of millions of poor families better and move people out of poverty not because I went to an individual family, but because as a data scientist, I was able to use my powers for good. Okay, same question to you, Stuart. We were, uh, we were challenged at UCSD to do this. Um, and 
you know, it's not a coincidence that we were roommates there and, and are now working super hard to do this. And what Greg said is where we're headed is um, we want to change the world and make it be great. And so for me, I would say um, make sure people understand what data science means. We just throw it around. We've said it 700 times on this webinar. Um, I usually offer the definition of data is information in context. And so I'll put 29 on the screen by itself and say, is this data? You know, and then I'll put, you know, that's my age and make a joke. And then I'll say, I'll do something about credit score. But I said, both, basically, data is information. And so the invitation to people to work with us is to say, we're going to help you learn more about your information, your information that's in your world and in what context it is. Is this good? Is it bad? Is it high? Is it low? Is it, it, does it lead to a decision? Does it tell me something about myself or the world I live in? That's a big responsibility and it involves a uh, emotional um, responsibility to the person or the people you're working with. And I've said it 10 times on this call, you can't overlook that. You can't just walk in with all your numbers. It has to be a relationship-based, trust-based um, uh, situation. So, you know, that's really what, what I'm in it is I brought 30 years of being a, a human professional to it and said, how do we make this information accessible and interesting and great? And that involves people's ability to trust. So the real takeaway is, why would I listen to you show me numbers about myself? Like Greg said, it's a weaponized so you can sell me something on Amazon. You may also like this. And, you know, I, I think we have a responsibility to make it safe and good and positive. <laughs> Right. Data Science Alliance, making data safe and good and positive. Yeah. yeah. Um, thanks. Zyra. Yeah, so um, Greg and Stuart already stole all of my <laughs> points, but I'll, I'll just um, rephrase and summarize by saying that um, I think data science can be misunderstood as um, something that threatens the way you do things, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. It can be also seen as a tool to help you improve um, the way you, you make decisions, to, to make transparent decisions that are understandable by anyone in your organization and that anyone can challenge because it's precisely because it's transparent and it's something that, you, that can be improved upon. Um, so I think that's, that's the main takeaway that we can be allies and we want to help. I love that, thank you. So it's, it's about one o'clock. I just want to take one really one minute to thank everyone. Thank you to our panelists, Zyra, Stuart, and Greg. I really appreciate you being so candid. And I, I had a fun time speaking with you. And I really loved learning more about your experiences. And thank you all for joining us, the attendees, for another episode of Data Stories. Um, I really appreciate everyone for being here uh, during this hour with me. And one last thing, I just want to wish a happy birthday to my dear friend and fellow ecosystem builder, Andy White. I hope you have a great birthday. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Thank you.